Tonight, we begin our Mysteries of the Mind series with a look at the smarter brain and what can be done to rejuvenate and recover brain power. All this week, Dr. Norman Deutsch will be joining us to set the scene for that evening's discussion. And he joins us now as we begin this special week of programming. Here he is, Dr. Norman Deutsch, author of The Brain That Changes Itself. It's great to have you back here at TVO. Thanks very much, Steve. Let's just get some basic definitions out of the way. Neuroscience means what? Well, uh, neuroscience, there's a narrow definition which would say it's the study of the, of the brain and nervous system and a broader definition which I favor, which is it's the study of the brain, nervous system and of course the function of those which is to produce our mental life. And it's really the solution to a problem, this broader definition, because we had several thousand years of learning about our minds with the help of philosophers and writers and the contemplative arts of the, of the East, but it's only been about 150 years that we've really been able to look at the brain side of it. And um, what happened is, you know, the, because these are two aspects of ourselves, um, and they're very, very different. We can't see our thoughts. We, it's, it's hard to, quote, measure thoughts. And the brain seems more susceptible to objective investigation. Is for about a hundred years of those, the beginning of brain science, many of the brain scientists thought we should just focus on the physical aspects of the brain and neglect the mind. And that meant that these two groups weren't talking to each other, and it created a huge problem. So neuroscience really is a big tent that's trying to bring these two sides together. And so it's a funny, dif uh, it's a funny discipline because the people who do neuroscience actually have trainings in psychology, uh, neuropsychology, psychiatry, psychoanalysis. That's you, yes? Yeah. Well, I'm a couple of those. You got all those, yeah. Uh, and but some are trained as cellular biologists, psychopharmacologists, um, geneticists, and neurophysiologists. And all of those people can contribute to this field. And I mean, the hope with the broad is that we can begin to correlate mind and brain in a way that we haven't been able to do okay. till now. New term, neuroplasticity. You're the guy who told us that our brains are plastic. What does that mean? Well, neuro is for neuron, the nerve cells in the brain, and plastic means adaptable, modifiable, changeable. And neuroplasticity is that property of the brain that allows it to change its structure and its function in response to mental experience. So it's a great concept in the sense of um, reminding us that neuroscience really has to be addressing both mind and brain. And after all, the public is interested in neuroscience because they think it's going to help us understand our, our minds uh, better. Um, and they're not as interested in some of the aspects of neuroscience that interest neuroscientists, you know, the, the chemical aspects and the molecular aspects. Well, let me get your view on one of the guys who's going to be on this program later and in a documentary at 9 o'clock tonight, Michael Merzenich. Yeah. Where do you put him? He's out of San Francisco. Where, where do you put him on the pantheon of people who understand the brain and its plasticity? Well, uh, he's, he's, he's right up there, somewhere between Zeus and Hera, I guess. <laughs> uh, Mike Merzenich basically is the, the person who did... There, there were various people who were arguing that the brain was plastic. And um, Mike is one of several people who did some experiments, and the experiments uh, showed that the brain was plastic, and these were basically accidental findings. And then what he did was he was able to do the experiment that persuaded the skeptics that the brain was plastic, that our mental, our, our brain maps actually change uh, with mental experience. And he also pioneered the cochlear implant, and then he went on to develop a number of, I call them brain exercises, not brain games, mm -hmm. um, that really have shown that people can train themselves to think faster, their neurons fire faster, stronger, better signals, which have been very helpful improving um, people who have learning disorder problems, of certain kinds and helping um, people as they get older to preserve their cognitive capacity. So he's, he's really a, a, an outstanding, outstanding scientist. But what you just said goes against 
conventional wisdom for decades, which yes. is the brain stops growing when you get to be, what, 20? <laughs> and, and then you're stuck with what you've got, basically, right? Um, that's, that's what we've heard the, for years. The optimistic way is say it, <laughs> to say it stops growing. The, the pessimistic way is to say it starts to deteriorate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, that was basically one of the things that happened in Western science is it's tried to focus increasingly on things that are measurable. And going all the way back to Galileo and the new physics, we started to see the world very mechanistically. Um, and things were seen as machine-like. The, the, whole, the whole cosmos was seen as like this cosmic clock. And the organs in the body were conceived of as machines. And of course, the heart is a pump, which is kind of like a machine. And the brain was seen as a machine with parts. And each part was thought to perform a, a single mental function in a single location in the brain. And the machines do wonderful things, but they don't grow new parts when they break down. They don't reorganize themselves. So the mainstream teaching up till even the, in many places, you know, even 2000, 2003, in many, many locations was that when you lose a mental function, there's nothing you can do to get it back. You try to work around it, perhaps. Um, and it well, was your book demonstrated that's just not so. I hope so. I think it did. And, um, but it also meant that our mental capacities that were given at birth that are genetically predetermined, um, largely, uh, are very fixed. And I think there's a lot of very compelling data now that shows that that's just not the case, that aspects of our cognitive functioning really can be trained just as you can train other things. And Every now and then you'll see a headline says, that'll say brain games don't work, this kind of thing. You really have to distinguish here between brain exercises that have been developed by you know, scores of first rank neuroscientists that have been tested and retested versus um, brain games and then the and casual then things we do. Wasting time on the internet. And maybe even crosswords and so on right. because one of the things they've done with the serious brain exercises is they've packaged them to look like games to keep people interested. Hmm. And that's because when you're interested in an activity, you secrete some brain chemicals, dopamine is one of them, that actually help consolidate connections. But I also saw evidence of IQ and things being raised when I was working with uh, doing the brain that changes itself and working with many different clinicians, working with kids who had learning disorders. Um, and as they were being addressed with brain exercises, they increased. And you could say, well, how do you know they increased? I, we know because we did IQ tests before, during, and after. So it really was IQ that was being changed. I'm going to stop you there because we don't want you to give up the whole shop on day one. We thank you for your contribution here to TVO. We're going to see lots of you this week. And um, here we go. Great. That's Dr. Norman Deutsch, author of The Brain That Changes Itself. Up next, we'll expand our discussion and explore further what the brain is capable of right after this. The brain is the most complex organ of the body and our knowledge of it is increasing rapidly. As scientists are mapping the connections in the brain, we are learning more and more about the brain's abilities. Joining us now to help uncover those abilities, in San Francisco, California, Michael Merzenich. He is a neurologist at the University of California. In Denver, Colorado, Nicholas Carr, author of The Shallows. And with us here in studio, Robin Green, University Health Network Canada Research Chair in Traumatic Brain Injury, and Jordan Peterson, clinical psychologist at the University of Toronto. It's great to have everybody both here in the studio and points beyond in our conversation tonight. We're so glad you could all join us. We also want the people watching this to be part of the conversation. Dr. Norman Doidge and our producer Sandra Jonas are hosting a live chat right now on our website. That's the agenda.tvo.org. So please join us with your questions or comments and they'll be with us until 9.30 tonight. Okay, let's start with this. Um, Michael, let's start with you in San Francisco. When we say smarter in terms of the brain, what are we actually talking about? 
Well, the brain uh, can, uh, is uh, subject to improvements of agility, or you could say variability in agility. Some brains are fast and, and, and generally accurate. Some brains are slow and generally inaccurate. And there's a wide range of ways that uh, people have mastered the ability. You could say brains are capable of manipulating information in controlling their actions. And uh, we identify a person that's good at manipulating information and controlling their actions in a highly flexible way as intelligent. I mean, we've all, we all know that when we see it, but it's really reflecting brain power, brain speed, brain accuracy, the ability of the brain to manipulate information in complex ways. So Robin, agility, manipulating information, anything you'd add to the list about what we mean when we say, boy, they got a smart brain in that head. Sure, I think in addition to that, and something we're not that great at measuring is um, much higher level, uh, higher level functions we sometimes call meta level abilities like um, being self-aware, um, <clears throat> monitoring ourselves, setting a goal and implementing the goal. But we don't really capture that too well in our IQ tests. Uh, okay, Jordan, you want to pick up on that? Well, some of the goal setting abilities in the self-monitoring seem to be associated with conscientiousness, a trait, and it has no relationship whatsoever to intelligence. Um, one of the things that wasn't really highlighted in, in the discussion of what SMART is so far is the capacity to learn and to learn quickly and then to apply that sure. knowledge because there's sort of the brain as an organ that's capable of processing information and then there's the brain as an organ that's capable of memory and the application of that, new, of that knowledge to new situations. So sometimes that's called fluid and crystallized intelligence. So. Okay, Michael, you referred to, or uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You wanted to add? Oh, I was just gonna say that a brain that's very accurate at high speed with high accuracy is a good, a brain that's, ac that's very effective at recording information. Mm -hmm. And you know, our understanding of things and, the, and uh, the ability to manipulate information and the ability to control complex actions and reactions is dependent upon having a good encyclopedic recording of information. I mean, if we're not really capable of restore, storing, recording information, and keeping it in present mind in a, in a powerful form, then we're not gonna make much of it. So all of these things are complexly interrelated, of course. Nicholas, I'm gonna get you in here at this point because, of course, we've talked to you in the past about your book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And one of the things that you have talked about is your deep concern that our so-called digital culture is affecting our ability to think deeply or think critically. Just sh share, share your thesis with us, if you would. Well, I think one thing we know about the brain, uh, thanks to some of the, the research done by your other guests, is, is that it adapts to our environment. It adapts to the circumstances in which we think. And so if you consider what, what's happened in the past five, 10 years is we've, we've really changed that environment. We, by introducing high speed networked computers, we ha we're constantly interacting with those devices, with those screens all the time, often from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to sleep. And I think that encourages us to think in a certain way, to take in lots of information very quickly, to multitask, uh, to be kind of distracted or interrupted and to be able to process those distractions and interruptions. But I think what the environment, what this new digital environment doesn't encourage us to do and doesn't allow us to practice is more contemplative ways of thinking. The ability to screen out distractions and think deeply and conceptually about information, which I think is naturally hard for us to do. We kind of, we seem to crave uh, distractions. And so I worry that we're losing our ability to control our thoughts and to control our attention. And as that happens, we also kind of lose our ability to think conceptually and deeply uh, and think at a very high kind of big picture level. Jordan, do you see this in your work? Is this a concern for you? Well, I haven't seen this sort of thing manifest itself in the clinical environment. Like, I mean, I, I think those are interesting ideas. and. It, it is a danger. Contemplation and imagination and play have their utility, and those are things that are best done in the absence of external stimulation. And, and I, I do see, say, among my kids, um, how much time they spend interacting with computer screens. Um, they do teach this? them to be very organized, though, because you have to be organized to keep a computer running. And, and they teach them to be fast. And so it isn't it isn't clear to me exactly what the end consequence of that is going to be, so I wouldn't say I'm worried about it. Okay, Robin, let me get you to, to weigh in on that as well. On the one hand, computers can 
enhance the brain's functions and activity. On the other mm -hmm. hand, Nicholas has made the point that it can be making us stupider at the same time. Right. Um, he well, didn't say it that way. I'm no. colloquializing a little bit there. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm probably a little bit less worried. I take, I take those points that you're making, certainly. Um, we were just talking about the definition of intelligence, and a, and a part of um, what intelligence is is negotiating our environment. And, and one could say that the internet is our environment. <laughs> um, but I, I worry a little bit about issues around distractibility. I think um, my lens is around reward. And what concerns me a bit is um, that the internet is feeding a need for a lot of reward. Much more frequent, much more frequent reward than um, maybe out there in the real world. So, for example, if I want to learn how to play an instrument, I need to put in hundreds or thousands of hours to achieve mastery, and there's not a whole lot of reward intermittently. Until you get to the finish line. Until you get to the finish yeah. line. So, making uh, that leap is maybe a challenge. I heard somebody from out of town trying Steve, to get in. Michael, was that you? Yeah. Can I weigh in on this a little bit, please? Uh, the average kid in, in, our, in our nation, your, my nation and yours, spends 10 or 11 hours a day looking at a screen. And what does that really mean? It means that they're largely absorbing information. Uh, when they're on the internet, that's a sort of favorable time for looking at a screen in the sense that they're reacting to it and they're acting on it in some level. But a large part of their interaction with media is, is only emotionally reactive, you could say. I mean, they're, op they're taking in information visually and emotionally. You know, we're really constructed, our neurology is constructed to make decisions about things in action. We're not really meant to be sitting in a chair 10 or 11 or 12 hours a day with our body lar largely disengaged, with our brain substantially disengaged except as an emotional receiver. And, and of course that matters. Of course it makes a difference. And a kid on the internet that, who learns to solve every problem by looking up answers is different from an individual who aggressively and on a heavy schedule reasons to answers. Of course, there, there are massive differences in the schedule of the way brains are engaged. And you could say there are advantages to both. I mean, what a wonderful thing to have the resources of the internet at, at our convenience, to have the information in such a way to be able to pile it into our brain, to manipulate it in all kinds of ways. We can't, can't manipulate it unless we have it. But on the other hand, you have to understand, people have to understand, that the habits of brain use are different and that the average brain of a child or adult now is very different from the average brain of a child or adult 20 years ago, 50 years ago, certainly 100 years ago, massively different. We're very different, in a sense, creatures because our brains are plastic and, of course, they're shaped by these heavy schedules of use. It depends to some degree, too, the effect of this on what you compare it to. You know, so kids are sitting in front of the internet 10 or 11 hours a day, say, but, you know, 30 years ago they were sitting in front of televisions for approximately the same amount of time. And I would say that the interactive nature of the internet and, and its broad, its capacity to disseminate broad information and to teach you skills is something that's certainly preferable to television. But we should also note that television seems to have been an entity that on average improved the intelligence of the population. Now, it might be that watching television wasn't good for a kid who could have been reading Shakespeare, but it was really good for, for a, say, a four-year-old who would have otherwise been stuck in a crib looking at the bars of the crib. So I think de determining what the consequences of these sorts of things are is something that might be better managed at a sort of more micro level of analysis. So, Nicholas, you want the last word on this question? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two important points. One is that if you look at statistics of how people, kids and adults, spend their time, television viewing hasn't gone down in the internet era. So what's happened isn't that we've traded television for other things online, it's that we've increased the amount of time we spend looking at screens. And I think the, the important point is, is that we're not, it makes it all too easy to simply be reactive to stimulation uh, because when, you know, if, you're, if you have messages coming in, alerts coming in all day long, you can allow those alerts, alerts and messages to take over what you pay attention to. In other words, you 
give over to the technology control of what you're thinking about. And that's very different from the way of thinking that when you are in control, when you're alone with your thoughts for some part of the day. And the big danger here, I think, is that particularly for kids, we're not giving them the opportunity to be alone with their thoughts and to engage in the kind of attentive, often contemplative thinking that ultimately is, I think, as important, at least as important to being able to think very quickly and to exchange lots of messages and to multitask or to have the illusion of multitasking. So I do think there's, there's, a, there's a danger here that we're kind of emphasizing one way of thinking but de-emphasizing another way of thinking that is actually very, very important. Okay, let me bring another voice into the conversation here and read an excerpt from something that Gareth Cook the Pulitzer Prize winning writer for New Yorker magazine wrote uh, last year about brain games. He wrote, a pair of scientists in Europe recently gathered all of the best research, 23 investigations of memory training by teams around the world, and employed a standard statistical technique called meta-analysis to settle this controversial issue. The conclusion, the games may yield improvements in the narrow task being trained, but this does not transfer to broader skills like the ability to read or do arithmetic or to other measures of intelligence. Playing the games makes you better at the games. In other words, but not at anything anyone might care about in real life. Jordan? I'm uh, I think that's what the literature indicates too. It's, it's easy to train people to develop uh, specific skills, but to get that to generalize to say improvements in fluid intelligence, which is kind of the gold standard, that's a, been a very, very elusive goal. Michael. I think that's total bunkum. <laughs> I think that in fact there are there are there are about 50 control trials. Actually, what happened? What Gareth Cook did is he he and, and what the meta-analysis did was they cherry picked what they call brain games. I mean, people have created brain games, quote, so quote unquote, that aren't effective and that aren't very well intelligently neurologically considered, and that can't expect in which you can't expect them to confer what are called far and near transfer effects in benefit. But actually, you can also create brain exercises, brain training strategies that do accomplish that and have been demonstrated to accomplish that in study after study. So we have, for example, supported about 45 studies conducted in about 20,000 individuals, and these are all intent to treat controlled trials, that measure far transfer effects. That is to say, you improve at things and then you see generalization to the operation of that kind of ability, that's a near transfer effect, in, in however they use it. And then you see far transfer effects. You can demonstrate that it actually impacts things that relate to everyday operations. So I can train somebody in a very elemental task. It doesn't seem to relate to how well you'd operate in using your phone or, or having a conversation with your neighbor or keeping track of what's happening in a social circumstance, but it does benefit those things. So actually, there's a very large body of evidence that there are brain, computer-delivered brain exercises that accomplish that. Of course, there are many others that don't. And, and I think this is, this is a very confusing landscape and that the press actually has contributed to the confusion. Some brain games, some brain training is intelligently considered and neurologically considered, and some is not, some are not. And you just have to basically sort out, you know, it's up to the individual to sort out where the evidence is that demonstrates such far transfer effects. Okay, the bunkum gallery wants in. Jordan, yeah. you first. Well, I think part of, the, <laughs> part of the issue with this disagreement might be stemming from definitions of intelligence. So for me to see evidence of what might be called far transfer, I'd have to see that sequences of brain games produced improvements in tests like the Raven's progressive matrices, which is a very, very accurate test right. of the central pool of, of, of skills that are associated with intelligence. And I could be wrong, but my understanding of the literature is that that sort of demonstration has been very, very hard to manage. Now, the degree to which skills can be transferred across related classes of cognitive or, or, or action-oriented events, that's a different story. But I was speaking specifically of intelligence, so psychometrically defined we've intelligence. A, we've actually measured that, and we've actually measured it with a rave. We haven't published it, unfortunately, but we've actually measured that in child and adult populations. And we do see very highly significant gains in the Ravens. Well, paper. I tell you, I'm waiting for and, that and, publication. But, but I, I want to I say, <laughs> let, let me just say one, one more thing about this. You know, if you look at the factors that contribute to intelligence, that account for intelligence, 
So for example, we know that aspects of brain processing speed account for about half of the variance in, in fluid intelligence. Mm -hmm. now, th this is a highly mutable characteristic in a brain. It's very easy to improve virtually every, relatively easy to improve almost every aspect of the operation of a brain at speed, operating at speed with accuracy. Robin Green wants in. I'm going to retract what I said before, and not just because I was accused of bunkin'. Bunkum. <laughs> Bunkum. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure whether we were talking about uh, brain games in general or just uh, gaming, but I am very interested in the benefits of these kinds of certain kinds of brain games that have been carefully designed to um, to have the active ingredients that um, we call environmental enrichment. So games that are continuously novel, uh, continuously challenging, that engage us. And I think that there is a lot of evidence in the literature that this kind of environmental enrichment changes the brain and changes our cognitive functioning. And it's a good thing or a bad thing or both? It's a, it's a, unequivocally, it's a good thing. Unequivocally a good um, thing. Certainly in the clinical world, this is something, this is um, a tool that we are using to try to promote recovery of the brain. And there's nice evidence that environmental enrichment promotes recovery after stroke, after traumatic brain injury. Um, in our work in brain injury, where we find, unfortunately, that in, in some people with severe traumatic brain injuries, there's there's a double whammy. You have not only the initial brain damage, but we see on top of that accelerated aging and maybe even neurodegeneration. And, but what we do find is that those people who report being more cognitively stimulated, that they show a buffering effect against this accelerated aging. And, and we're now using brain games to try to um, do that in a more proactive way. What's your favorite? Am I allowed to say? I guess, why not? Brain HQ, it's got the best experimental data behind it. Is that Michaels? Yeah. It is Michaels, okay. Yeah. No, he's, he's in this. Okay, Jordan, you wanted a word. Well, a few years ago, I went through the literature trying to figure out what, what employers could do to improve the sort of cognitive and emotional functioning of their poor performing employees. And what I concluded from, from, from that study was that exercise was actually far, more, far superior, especially for adults, in, in terms of improving general intelligence. So as you age, your, your fluid intelligence, which is in, in some ways very tightly related to processing speed, but also to the number of variables you can manipulate simultaneously in abstraction, mm -hmm. that, that goes downhill very rapidly. It's an extremely dismal graphic picture. But both cardiovascular exercise and weight training can, can help older people restore their cognitive ability better, as far as I've been able to tell, than any kind of cognitive training in terms of pure power of effect. Robin? So. There's, um, there's some really nice data on the interplay between, or the, the respective roles of exercise and cognitive stimulation. And so um, findings that show that exercise increases the prolif proliferation of new cells in, in particular, the memory areas of the brain, while cognitive stimulation promotes the survival of those cells. So many of them die off, and also the integration of those cells into existing networks. I should just let everybody know, because we're doing Mysteries of the Mind all week long, that's Thursday's show. So if you're interested in that angle, come back and see us Thursday. I do want to follow up with you, because there's a, a documentary which I saw the other day, and it's going to be airing right after this program's over, called Redesign My Brain. Mm -hmm which was right. just breathtaking in its, um, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to characterize it any further because people will watch it afterwards, and it was just terrific. We get to right. see you working with the subject, trying to get him to improve on his cognitive skills, and you focus on four areas. Let's just start there. What are the four areas that you focus on? Well, we tried to improve his brain speed. We tried to basically under control. That is to say, speed is in gro growing speed without accuracy, without sustaining accuracy is not valuable. So it's brain speed with con with with uh, retained accuracy. We tried to improve his attention control. That's really critical and for a mo high functioning brain. You know, the, you want that you want that to be advanced. And then we focused on his memory. His ability to record information accurately, of course, this also relates to the recording information accurately at speed in a highly salient way. This is all part of the picture. And then we focused on coordination, you could say, on the manipulation of information, you could say, across the great systems of the brain to control complex actions. So this wonderful man, Todd Sampson, who you'll, you'll see in the program, 
actually, he's actually a Canadian, uh, Australian. He's an expat Canadian. Uh, goes through about three months of training. He worked for about an hour and a half to two hours a day. And, and we, basically, we tried to advance all of these abilities in a, and then look in his brain and look in his behavior before and after training to see if we could make a better Todd. And um, hmm. I'm not going to tell you what happens to Todd because that'll take some of the fun away from it. But, uh, of course, we were optimistic that on some level we could make a better Todd. And you did. And I think people will see that. I think people will see that we did. You did. Yes, Robin. I just wanted to flag that I think one of the discrepancies in the literature in terms of response to brain games and this idea of environmental enrichment is that it is a lot easier to show effects in um, people who are cognitively vulnerable in some way. Mm -hmm. So we see much right. more dramatic effects in people who've had brain injuries, in older adults, in premature babies, especially in uh, the animal literature, for example. Hmm. Jordan. That's an important point, I mean, because there is a big distinction between helping people recover. Um, and, and the exercise data that I pointed to earlier is actually helping older people recover the cognitive function they had when they were young. So it isn't necessarily you know, altering the brain structure at a fine neurological level, but it is re-establishing cardiovascular integrity and that makes your brain more efficient as a physiological organ. So it's raising IQ among typical people using brain exercises that's something that I don't think I've seen credible um, research uh, pertaining to. And you know, about to be published data is good data, but uh, you know, I can't be expected to know that and I'll believe it when I see it. Okay, and I'm good, I was actually going to go to Nicholas on this as well and say, is there anything that you've heard so far that might make you reevaluate some aspect of what you've published already? No, not, not really. <laughs> in, in fact, I, I think as, as Dr. Merzenich made clear, one of, the, one of the crucial attributes of intelligence is the ability to control one's attention which is another way of saying the ability to distinguish what's important from what's not important. And this is, this is actually, you might think that this is an easy task. Actually, it's very, very hard for people to do that. It's very easy to get distracted by trivia. And I think one, one very interesting study, it was published in 2009, done out of Stanford University, showed, for instance, that the more people multitask online, the less able they are to distinguish important stuff from unimportant stuff, the less able they are to control their attention. What happens is you just become enamored of anything that's new. So it doesn't matter whether it's important or trivial, the fact that new information comes toward you is what captures your attention and captures imagi your imagination, captures uh, the, the focus of your brain. And so I think if we agree that the ability to control your attention, distinguish what you should be focused on from trivia is crucial to the way our brain works, then you can see how you know, walking around with a, a smartphone or a tablet uh, all day long, constantly interacting with it is a kind of new experience we have very recent, just, just very recently, and it tends to undermine that control over our attention, the control over our thoughts that is so, so very important to our intelligence. Michael, did you want to follow up on that? Well, I just wanted to say that uh, everybody is improvable. I mean, uh, even people that are operating at a high level are improvable. Of course they are. Whatever their level of ability, however accurately they take in information and manipulate it in, at high speed with high accuracy and in, in complexity, of course they can improve that. We know you can improve that. And, and basically, we've created brain exercises that are designed to improve that. Now you, can, you can see an example of this in Redesign My Brain. Watch what happens to Todd, and then decide for yourself whether this very high performance individual has been improved. And you know, in the program, you might, might just to give it a little bit of a way, we don't leave it to chance. We extensively evaluate where, where, what this man can do when he begins this, uh, this uh, adventure. We look in his brain extensively over several hours of brain recording and brain imaging, and then we look again at the end of, his, of this adventure. And uh, I, wait, I, I, I encourage the audience to just take a look <laughs> at that and try to decide whether or not they believe that this individual of high performance has been improved by brain training or not. Robin. Have you had a chance to, um, to look yet at whether those 
effects, those benefits are enduring. And the reason I ask is we've been really interested in the idea of making people smarter. And that comes from people telling us that, and our own introspections, that after studying for exams, um, people feel smarter. And not just more knowledgeable, but sharper. But um, right. there isn't any evidence that that after every single exam or every time someone has studied for an exam, they get smarter and their IQ goes up and up and up. So it must be right. reverting. Yes, Robin, we've supported scientists. I mean, we the uh, scientists out in the university communities that have looked longitudinally, so they've trained and then looked later. There's just a study has just been published from a, an original training, uh, 10, 10 hour long training session that was conducted about 12 years ago. And what was looked at recently was the data that comes back from the 10 year benchmark. So imagine uh, 12 years ago, 3,000 or so citizens uh, worked at an intensive, progressive intensive training exercise. It's an exercise that we routinely apply in our brain training repertoire because we know of its powers. And then the question is, how strong is the impact of this 10 hours recorded in their brains five years later? There was extensive five-year testing was done, and then now 10 years later. You can distinguish the population of people that use this exercise in their abilities, in, their, in the levels of their sustained independence in a series of ways that are really interesting 10 years later. So you can look to that. This has been published. This re initial report was published in the last week. At five years, very substantial differences were recorded in their, in their health, in their sustained in, in, uh, independence, in, the, in their brain speed and operations, because this particular task, among other things, was designed to improve brain speed and brain accuracy. So that's about the best 10 hours these individuals have spent in life. And another study conducted at the University of Iowa in about 700 individuals, a scientist estimated the, value, the time it would take in a series of, of generalized abilities coming from a, a relatively elementary form of brain training. Again, it's 10 hours of brain training, and now we look at the generalized abilities, all kinds of increased cognitive powers are associated with this 10 hours spent. And then he estimates how long, by looking later in time, this effect will endure before people are back to the starting line, as if they'd had no brain training. Turns out that that duration is between about almost two years to almost seven years in different measures that he has. So there's a long enduring effect. So of course, that's because if you change the brain in the right way, it will use these new assets in its operations and sustain it. It's something that we're continuously interested in. And of course, we're trying to drive changes in brains that empower them, that change their operational characteristics that are sustained. Jordan. Um, I'd be interested in Mike's response to the to the Head Start data, I mean, you, you may know about the Head Start program in the U.S. It was implemented as part of the Americans' War on Poverty back in the 60s, and the idea was that the early enrichment of children's environment would lead, at minimum, to long-term cognitive gains. And so the idea was, well, if you get, could get deprived children into an enriched environment, that would bring them up to speed, and then the consequences of that would increase through time, right, because they got this early start. But what happened, and this is one of the most well-documented phenomena in the history of cognitive research, was that all the other kids caught up by grade six. There was no long-term improvement in cognitive ability whatsoever. And so, I mean, right. I'd, I'd be very happy to believe that there are brain exercises that would improve your intelligence, especially in a 10-hour period. That would be a lovely thing, and it, God only knows what computers are capable of. But um, <clears throat> it's very difficult for me Jordan. to believe. George, the, Jordan, the difference is, is that those, those, that exercise, that, that training was primarily uh, focused on content and, okay. and, and on, on socialization. And content and socialization are really important in the end. You know, we have to load our brains with content. But they weren't based upon the more elemental aspects of the operation of a brain as a receiver and recorder of content. The, the way that you would train a brain to make it more powerful, the more effective, more intelligent, is very different from the way you would approach loading it with content. Mm -hmm. To a very large extent, educational systems are focused on, dedicated to, socializing children and loading their brains with content. 
But there's more to a brain and its operations and powers than that. You could actually improve brain power itself. And, and basically, I think education is, is increasingly understanding this, increasingly understanding that this is what has to happen to the young child that's going to struggle if you don't basically help them in this more neurological way. So I think we're, we're awakening to the fact that we can do a lot more for children at a young age that can change their life courses by thinking about this more in the, this more, old, more uh, intelligent neurological way. Nicholas, you've been very patient. You want to come in here? Well, <clears throat> I, I think there's, there might be a danger in, in focusing too much in this conversation on, on brain ga games and in, in uh, various techniques that you know, we need to be careful not to give the impression that there's some magic bullet for improving your intelligence, uh, improving your, your, uh, your mind's ability to function and your ability to think deeply. Uh, you know, the brain and the, the, and the mind are, are very complex uh, organs. They're, they're, they're connected to the body. They're connected to the environment. And, and I think certainly Playing certain types of well-designed games can probably uh, improve certain aspects of, uh, of your mental functioning. But what I, what I think is of most important is to make sure from a young age that people have diverse experiences, social experiences, uh, experiences with being on their own, with solitude, uh, with interacting with the world in many different ways, with doing exercises. I mean, if you want to tap into the full capability of, of the human brain, which is an amazing capability, you have to have lots of different experiences, uh, not relegate yourself to you know, looking at a screen all the time or to doing any other uh, type of interaction with the world in, in a kind of you know, overly restrictive way but simply to get out there and, and, and think in lots of different ways, uh, think socially, think on your own, interact uh, with people and with the world in many different ways. And, and, and I think having those diverse experiences is gonna be more important to your long-term mental health and, and abilities than trying to do one thing very, very well. Nicholas, let me follow up with, since you mentioned social experiences, with a bit of a workplace example that I suspect a lot of people who are watching us right now have in their daily jobs. A lot of people work in open offices, right? People don't have places where they can go and close the door and shut out the rest of the world. How does that potential for distraction, in your view, affect someone's ability to function? Well, it, I, th I think it depends on the job. I, I mean, there are some jobs where your ability to constantly interact with your colleagues in order to solve usually to solve well-defined problems is very important and is central to your experience of work and to your success at work. And so having one, an open plan like that might be absolutely crucial to doing your best work. On the other hand, there are jobs that really require innovative conceptual thinking that requires time to be alone with your thoughts and to not be distracted even by socializing, but to be able to to, to take what you've learned from other people, to take what you've learned from reading or experiencing other things, and to be in a quiet place and alone with your thoughts and think through that methodically. So I, I, think, I, I don't think we can say one way of working or one way of thinking is better. They're suited to different purposes. Can we, uh, and, and I know for people who watch the documentary at 9 o'clock after this program is over, you will see some of this, but Michael, perhaps you could uh, make a bit of a list for us in which activities you believe engage the brain more than others and therefore result in those kinds of improvements that you've been talking about. Well, first of all, uh, I agree completely with Nicholas that, that it's all about uh, integrating experience in life and th there, there are great advantages to getting the boost that brain exercises can provide to you. I, mean, I don't really like to call them brain games because that's confusing. They're, 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 they're brain-changing exercises that, are, that, are, that, are, that have been created that are, that are really exactly that. They're designed specifically to drive the brain in corrective direction, but they're just part of the picture. There are all kinds of things that a person can do and that we had Todd do that we know would contribute to his improved performance abilities in what, in, in, as, a, as a human being. So, for example, we trained him to juggle. That seems like a simple thing. It is a simple thing in a way, but it's, it's a pretty complicated 
integrated, you know, coordinated sensory motor behavior that requires uh, fast, accurate actions in the control of action on the basis of immediately received sensory information. We trained them in to, to, to perform sleights of hand and tricks of magic. We trained them in, in to develop memories, and all, all of the, oh, the whole series of sort of everyday activities that we know would progressively engage his brain to increase its sort of operational, online, real-time powers. So we used a combination of real, real-world activities, physical and mental, physical control, mental control. The brain is always engaged, always involved in these, always progressive, with, with things that Todd did in, you know, on the computer. And of course, the cumulative impacts of this can be powerful, just like it can be powerful if any of us goes through a transformative period in our life where we really focus on improving our abilities uh, across the relatively narrow window of time. There's tremendous power in using computers for good. And, and you can drive brains in positive and improving directions. You can actually use them, for example, to increase your ability to sustain your attention and, and not to respond to distractions. At the same time, you can use the computer for in a sense, in ways that grow your distractibility and, and, and limit your ability to sustain your attention and keep on task. Hmm. Uh, given the opportunity in, in Redesign My Brain, of course, we put Todd on exercises that we designed in real life and on the computer to be all in the direction of the good. And it, we won't spoil the ending, but people can watch and see what happened. No. Robin, with your work, you work right. with people who've experienced traumatic brain injuries. Have, have you discovered that there's only so much you can do? You can, you can put people through all of the different activities and, and brain exercises and so on, but the reality is there's a wall you run up against. Is that the case? I hope not. This is exactly what we're working on. Is we're trying to see um, how... So we know that if someone has a, a brain injury, let's say a serious brain injury from a car accident or a fall, um, or if they have a stroke, we can put them in front of a TV set for three or six months and their brain will spontaneously recover. And then it will, um, that recovery will start to peter out. And um, we don't really understand why it does that, but what we're trying to do is to um, um, push much further recovery. And our approach has been to try to offset what is a whole other mechanism, which is this accelerated aging that I was talking about before. But one of our critical questions is whether, um, if we can enhance a person's functioning by this kind of intensive cognitive stimulation that we've been talking about, perhaps combined with exercise as well, um, is it a one-shot deal, or do we have to do it for the rest of their lives? Mm -hmm. and, do you know the answer to that yet? The jury is still out. The jury is still out. Sounds like, though, use it or lose it. I mean, that would make sense, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, and we think that the principles that apply to older, uh, use it or lose it in older adults apply directly to people with brain injury. And in fact, many of the um, circumstances are quite similar. So uh, people with older adults aren't using it as much because they retire, they aren't engaging in the world, and this is certainly under the purview of Michael Merzenich, uh, they lose some of their perceptual and cognitive functions and that causes them to disengage for a variety of reasons. Um, this is what happens to people with traumatic brain injury, right? They can't go back to work, they can't go back to school, they don't socialize as, mu as much for a variety of reasons and so they're not using it. And so we're trying to, we think that part of the reason that they're showing this these problems in the longer term is because um, because they're not using it. So in fact, at a brain level, the healthy parts of the brain have been disconnected from the damaged parts, and so they're not getting stimulated. But then at a behavioral level, people are pulling out of their environments and not getting stimulated. So we do think that the answer may be, and we have a little bit of evidence to show that, um, for both problems is to really in, uh, intensively cognitively stimulate. Mm. Jordan, what do you think's at stake here? A smarter brain begets what? Well, intelligence is an unbelievably powerful predictor of life success for people, for example. Apart from trait conscientiousness, there, that's about equally important, possibly. So smarter people, um, they're more innovative. Uh, they tend to live longer. 
they're more productive, um, and th the societies in which the abilities of smarter people are allowed to manifest themselves more fully are also far more economically productive. It's a big deal. One IQ point gain is worth approximately $1,000 a year in salary. So How do you know that? There's been economic analysis of the relationship between intelligence and productivity. It's a very well-defined field. So, and so you can make estimates of that magnitude. That's in an industrial society you know, where, where cognitive power is obviously important. So it's a big deal. Smart is a big deal. Michael, do you know what Todd's IQ was? This is the man in the documentary we'll see after this program's over. What it was when he started and where it was when he finished? No, he actually uh, thought that this was private information and he didn't want to have it. You know, I, I wanted him to, uh, to be tested in his, in his uh, flexible intelligence, but he chose not to. And, uh, but on the other hand, what we did do was to look in his brain and in his behavior at a series of measures that have been strongly correlated with intelligence to see if they moved, and they all moved in a positive way that would be interpreted in brain respond responding or in, or in behavioral measures as being correlated with or, in, or consistent with an increase in intelligence. But he just chose not to have his intelligence measured, and I don't blame him. Just to make one comment about the what's at stake here is sure. beyond questions of IQ points or salaries and stuff. There's also, you know, the, the more flexible uh, your mind is, the more you're able to think on your own and think conceptually, the more satisfying and fulfilling your life will tend to be, right. whatever your <clears throat> occupation right. or your uh, social economic status. So there's a, there's a very much a, <clears throat> excuse me, personal stake here as well. Hmm. Jordan, you've done some, some testing, right, on this self-authoring testing? What's that? Oh, well, um, when I've been involved in management consulting for a while, and part of that was hiring selection, but often the managers that I talked to were more interested in what they could do to make their poorly, poorly performing employees perform better. And so for a long time, I didn't really have an answer to that question. One answer turned out to be exercise, but I also started to look at a literature showing that um, if you did writing, uh, autobiographical writing, or writing that's oriented towards the future that would reduce uncertainty, that that would improve your productivity and your mental and physical health. Some of that was done by James Pennebaker at the University of Texas at Austin. And then the productivity research, a lot of that's been done at the Rotman um, here, in, here in Toronto. Um, the exercises that I've developed are online. And what they have people do is step through a process of writing deeply about their past and their present, their personality traits, and, and their virtues and faults, and then also designing a plan for the future three to five years down the road. And part of what makes people inefficient as goal-directed creatures is that we're not very well unified with regards to our intent. And so in some ways, we're in an internal battle constantly about what it is that we should be doing. And I guess that manifests itself in part in doubt and worry. And also, if our goals aren't well defined, and it's hard for us to experience positive emotion because we generally experience positive emotion as we're moving towards a desired goal. So no goal, no positive emotion. Anyways, we tested this, this program, the future one in particular at McGill University a couple of years ago with kids who were struggling academically. And, we, and so there was 40 of them and 40 were, were put on, we, we used a control group where, who actually had to go fair, through a fairly sophisticated psychological self-assessment as the comparison treatment. And we raised the um, academic performance of the, of the struggling kids by about 25%, dropped their dropout rate by 30%. Wow. And then we've been doing the same thing at Erasmus Business School in, in Rotterdam, now with 2,500 students. And we've raised their overall academic achievement by <coughs> about 30% and knocked their dropout rates by 25%. And so there's also a large literature on this sort of thing, by the way, completely independent of the work that I'm doing, showing that writing that reduces uncertainty or that addresses threat improves immunological and mental health function and also makes employees about 10% more productive. Hmm. And that's, that's people writing about their own personal goals, not, not corporate goals. One thing I must say, the one thing that never changes is the length of this program. We have 60 minutes and we're done. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for joining us today for a fascinating discussion. Michael Merzenich, 
on the line from San Francisco, California. We look forward to seeing you in the documentary immediately following this program. Nicholas Carr out of Denver, Colorado, the name of his book, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. Robin Green, the Canada Research Chair in Traumatic Brain Injury here in Toronto. Jordan Peterson, the clinical psychologist at the U of T. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.